And we will do it from uh, the slideshow and from start. There we go. Everybody see me? Uh, I do. Yes. Okay, you do, Vince. Okay, great. And I just want to be sure I'm not on mute. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to minimize this. Okay, well, thank you, um, Ivan, in particular, for telling me about this club. He's very passionate about the club and reading your newsletter and listening to a few talks earlier um, in the past year. Uh, it's very impressive. You're very organized. And some of your speakers have been really good. Um, now, you know, a few years ago, and it wasn't very long ago, uh, the president of the F photography club where I live in Sarasota, Florida, said, Barry, um, your photos remind me of uh, Cartier Bresson. You must be a street photographer. So I, I said, okay, sure. And then I went to look up to see who is Cartier Bresson. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of him before, vaguely familiar. And street photography, I knew nothing about. Uh, but in reading and looking at the photographs of uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, indeed, I had many that sort of were very similar. And so um, it, it became a hobby of mine to, to do street photography and read about it. And then it became a passion. So uh, I know you had a talk on street photography about two months ago. Um, our, our speaker is Joe um, Barry. He's on tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, was it about six weeks, two months ago, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Uh, and street photography is as much about the photographer as it is about the subject. And so there are many flavors of street photography. And I'm going to give you a sample of mine and uh, hope you enjoy it and get kind of an insight into where I'm coming from. Um, now, um, this is not uh, Goldie, my wife, um, although Goldie <laughs> persuaded me to use this. It's a selfie photograph. I don't remember where I took it, but um, uh, this is me uh, with, with this um, personable individual. Uh, Goldie and I, like your previous speaker, Goldie and I uh, travel a lot together, but we do it very differently. We visit art museums. She's my muse. We change art from one type of art to another when we go into a museum. She's my muse on the street. She helps distract people if I need to take a photograph and not get interrupted or... Um, Oh, I need to pretend I'm photographing her, but I'm photographing somebody else. So uh, here you should be able to see uh, Goldie. Let's just see. Nope. Next one and the next one. Okay. Whoops. There we go. So this is a typical classic photograph of Goldie uh, in an art museum confronting a security guard. And we are... Um, I'm taking this photograph, but that's actually the, the piece of art. Now we moved to Florida, having moved, having lived in Reading, uh, New York City, Jersey City, September 11th there, up to Woodstock, New York down to Philadelphia and finally land up in, in Florida uh, where there's a great passion and you can, for certain things, uh, certainly you can see the politics, uh, the guns at the bottom right, the American flag for sure. And um, they have an annual rally, motorcycle rally, thousands of people descend on the town I'm crossing the street. I see a scene in front of me and crossing an intersection is a great spot for taking a, a street photograph. People are intent on crossing over the road. So a quick photograph um, captures action and they're not likely to be uncomfortable because they intent on crossing the street. So I, I didn't know what the narrative was, but I took the photo and subsequently the narrative emerged. 
uh, here we have a man, center of the photo, looking at this guy wearing the American flag, of course. You'll always see some vestige of American flag in every photo in Florida, virtually. He is looking at her. Alpha male boyfriend is glaring at this guy. And she is like the girl from Ipanema, doesn't see anything and just walking straight ahead. Now, we, we live a little distance from all the action there. It's a wonderful location. It's called Pelican Cove. It's a nature preserve. It's an arts colony. And uh, best of all, it's 10 minutes away from Siesta Key, which is regularly rated as the number one beach in America. Uh, now, it's number one beach mostly because of its white sand, which isn't sand, but is crystalline, pure, pure white quartz crystals. So here's a picture of it. Um, and well, there are a few girls in the picture as well, but focus on the, uh, don't be distracted. There's lovely white sand. Here you see the sand better. Um, but once again, the flag. And I'm teaching a course on the joy of street photography. Every year I sort of teach a different course there. And this is an old high school building, which was converted into a museum, a contemporary art museum. And it's a branch of the Ringling College of Art and Design. And uh, we have our classrooms there. It's magnificent inside. It's a beautiful building. Um, and it's, it's a great privilege to teach there. So I'm teaching the joy of street photography, where I combine positive psychology, which is the psychology of happiness with street photography, because this has been quite a heck of a year and we need joy in our lives. We need to reconnect with joy. Uh, and many of us are traumatized, dispirited and that sort of thing. And street photography for me is a very joyful experience. We're gonna go into that. Take a look at this photograph. This is on Siesta Key Beach. There you can see more of the white sand. Every Sunday night, there's a drum circle or there was prior to COVID and a great place for street photography because everyone's photographing. So people are either showing off by dancing in the center or photographing. So if you're a nervous novice, great spot. And there's a lot of movement all around. So I sit with my back to the sunset and in front of the ring of people so I can get a good view. And she's happy, she's leaning forward, it's a spontaneous laugh, spontaneous laugh. Uh, this little kid is a smaller, but looking straight at me. And it's important to have at least one person look straight at you if you're a street photographer. It draws you in as a photographer and the view in as well. And of course, here's a smaller kid uh, with a flag looking at the older uh, of her, uh, the older ones. And then there's this little one back here with a ring. And the way I see it, my eye just follows along in a diagonal, like, like a set of Russian dolls. Now, when I'm photographing, I don't plan any of this, but I intuit that I, I let myself go. I'm in the excitement of the time and I intuit that it's a good shot. And it, then it likely uh, is to, to actually turn out that way. Philadelphia, the gay outing event, having a good time with a selfie. I love to photograph selfies. Uh, as people are taking selfies, they concentrate on that and I get to take my photo of them. About two years ago, I was in London, Goldie and I, and we were heading into center of London. And at the station, we saw lots of people in costume like this. We asked them, what's up? They said, there's a, an international rugby uh, festival um, at Twickenham and we all dress up in national costumes. So naturally we took <laughs> their train and we went in the opposite direction. We got there with thousands of people are streaming and it was tough to take a photograph. There was so much movement. So I went to a particular spot leading to the stadium 
waited for something to happen. I saw them coming for, towards me and I stepped right into the center of the sidewalk, sort of ambushing them about 15 feet in front, just enough time for them to see me register and spring into a spontaneous pose. And I got the shot. Um, by about 11 or 12 o'clock, by the way, they're all half drunk, but the time I was there, they were sober and happy. Uh, another photograph of Siesta Key Beach, that's our resident witch. And I asked if I could take a selfie of myself in the sunglasses. And of course she was happy to oblige. And we have a big colony of uh, visiting Amish and Mennonite. Uh, and you'll see those girls in the background. Now, what do they all have in common? Each one of these photographs has one thing in common and that everyone is, has a smile. So I am seeing lots and lots of smiles. Now, what positive psychology teaches us is that a smile spurs a chemical reaction in the brain, releasing hormones, including dopamine and serotonin, and these hormones increase our feelings of happiness and reduce our stress level. So the act of smiling, even if it's a small forced smile, uh, increases one's level of happiness. So I see a bunch of smiles, I connect, I make eye contact, I smile in return to their smiles, my level of happiness increases, other people see I'm happy, they smile at me and I get a positive cycle of, of happiness. And this is just one factor, one feature of street photography that improves my health, happiness uh, uh, and well-being. And what positive psychology has shown us and the science of it has shown us, and that this is started by Martin Seligman in Philadelphia. Prior to that, it was all about Freud and his path pathology, uh, the pathological side of psychology, the negative side. Seligman brought us the positive and he showed that 40% of one's level of happiness comes from the practices that one does. 50% is your one's genetics and only 10% life circumstances. So I compiled a list of things that happen in street photography that science, in some cases that they've studied, increase one's level of, of happiness. For example, I do a lot of walking with a camera uh, and walking improves one's happiness level. Um, certainly smiling, gratitude, awe, excitement, and passion. Well, talking about passion, <laughs> uh, you're Ivan, um, in Philadelphia, we're eating on, I think, 2nd Street in the old city. We're having dinner. And I'm noticing Ivan is busy photographing. Um, and I think to myself, gosh, he's got this compulsion. Here we are having dinner and he's photographing. But then I realize I'm photographing him. So I too have this compulsion. I'm never without my camera. And here I am photographing Ivan, who's photographing something or other. Now that was, <laughs> this is the first photograph that I've taken of Ivan. Uh, he sent it to me recently. And here is Ivan on the left with his girlfriend, Mandy. Amazingly, both Ivan and I remember her name. And I hate to think how many years ago I took this photo, but it's sort of a reminder that in the old days, you know, you take photograph with film and I'm a kid, I'm I think a young teenager and I go take it to the pharmacy and Mr. Barron sends it off and I wait for a week and I see the photo and I'm very excited. Of course, the background's terrible, the photo's blurry and all that, but that's what I did uh, back then. Ivan, you looked very cute then. So street photography, one of gazillion uh, definitions is the impulse or compulsion to take candid pictures in the stream of everyday life. 
nothing more than a compulsion to take photographs as you go along in life. But all of art is compulsion. It didn't start with street photography. If you know anything about uh, cave art, 37,000 years ago, this was created. Magnificent piece of art. And in fact, I've been into a cave in France uh, and saw um, a cave art that goes back uh, 16,000 years. And when you see it in the flesh, as it were, it's magnificent, very powerful, very skilled. So this is the El Castillo cave. And people did this cave art, these hand paintings around the planet. But nothing's really changed fundamentally. I was in Philadelphia with the Pope's visit and there was a big sheet of paper where somebody had put up and invited children to put their hands in paint and put it against the sheet. So I took, uh, went there and I saw a kid doing it with a mother, whipped out my camera and he jumps up and says, no, no, forbidden, can't take picture of child. Not allowed to take photos of children. Of course, I took the photograph and his hand is included in all the hands. And there's, it says hands over here and sort of it helped to make the photograph. It made the photograph more interesting that had he not jumped up to do that. But the compulsion to do art goes back way longer than 37,000 years. I mean, that's quite amazing. The oldest piece is 300 to 500,000 years ago, which means it was created by pre-humans, by primates. So this compulsion to take photographs, no matter what one does, just is inherent. And that's a big part of street photography. Uh, Gary Winogrand is the, was the master of this. He took over a million photos. He had a total obsession. But why my compulsion, as I think about it, it's because it makes me happy. When I think of going to New York City, the first thing I think about is, wow, that's, I'm gonna be photographing in New York City. And once I was on the train to the city and I realized I'd forgotten my camera <laughs> and I had to turn all the way back because there was no point in going to New York City without a camera. So there's the passion, the excitement, the action, the flow of being in the moment in a festival where I'm just totally in it. I was once in a, um, a color, color festival in Pittsburgh where they dump tons of, of color paint powder over the uh, participants, the people who are running this race. And I was right in there until I realized my camera was covered with uh, paint and I had to make a, a hasty exit. But then there's sort of the whoops, and there's sort of the connection with the people I photograph, I share my photos, I get some feedback. And then when I look back at my photos with Goldie myself, uh, I get a lot of satisfaction, which is another form of happiness. So that's a big thing. And uh, what they've shown is that this is the pleasure center, the brain pleasure center right there, sort of the G spot of the brain. It lights up when one sees beauty, one is experienced pleasure. When a mathematician sees a wonderful formula, math formula that has balance and simplicity, that part of the brain lights up. And that lights up for me when I, uh, when I uh, see photographs that I've taken. So we're walking in New York City and I've got all these thoughts about happiness because I was teaching in New York at the time and there was a construction site and this is the board that you know, protects the site and it's all the factors that science have found uh, makes one happier. The reason I took the photo is, for, uh, is because you'll notice that Goldie's in it and as you'll see, she's like a chameleon. Wherever we are, there's a background that matches her outfit. Red, white, black, yep. You don't need much money to be happy. And I can see he's smiling. 
And if you can't see it, he's reading Glamour magazine. And he has his coffee and a bin for coins. So I recently discovered that the, the world's, he claimed to be the world's largest model railroad. Certainly in the USA it is. And he built it and it's in New Jersey. And when I get back north, I hope to take my grandkids there because it is open. Um, and and uh, Bruce said, the only good in life is to be happy. The time to be happy is now. And the way to be happy is to make someone else happy. So thinking about it, you know, prioritize happiness over money. That's the most important thing is happiness. Focus on the now in the present, not 15 years from now when I retire, that's when I'm going to be happy. It's happiness in the present. And prioritize the happiness of others over one's own. So one might ask, and it's usually the first question, you don't really photograph strangers, do you? And certainly not without permission. Yes, the happiness includes strangers. <laughs> Sarasota farmer's market. I'm, uh, I, I'm sitting having coffee and I see a walk by and I turn around and I ask, may I take your portrait? I need to ask permission of these few because I was so close. I couldn't like just do it. And she bursts out laughing. And of course you can see she's spilling her coffee all over her. Why she's wearing a red nose, I have no idea. Miami, may I take your portrait? He thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. Uh, it's this gigantic uh, margarita that I, I thought was intriguing. Lower East Side in Manhattan, the most handsome of couples walking by. Uh, they saw me, they made eye contact. I couldn't just lift up the camera. I said, may I take your portrait? Sure, took theirs. So I was walking with my cousin Lara in Brooklyn and I'm walking behind, we're walking behind this couple that look a little goth-like. And she asked me, you know, we were discussing street photography and she said, but what, what exactly, how would you photograph them? Now, you know, a lot of people would photograph from behind. I didn't. Um, <laughs> I'm saying that tongue in cheek, of course I did. But I ran forward around him and I spun around just a little further, and I asked, may I take your portrait, which I say portrait rather than photo because it, it lends dignity, and they let me. And what a pleasant little treat to see what he's carrying. And he told me that the, his son's name is in um, this tattoo, but I couldn't make it out. <coughs> So I improvised. I felt what was appropriate when photographing them. I could have gone much further, turn around and photograph from a distance, a, maybe a little telephoto or something. But um, one, one knows, you know, when is it appropriate to ask permission and it'll get a, one will get a better photo or when to do it just as an action shot. So I don't just photograph strangers, of course. Here's my friend, Bruce. He loves that me taking his photo. He's got an incredible fatigue and he's vegan and he eats nothing. And he exercises 20, you know, five mile bike ride before breakfast. So we're on the beach, I'm taking his photo, but I'm waiting for them to push that man just behind because Bruce doesn't know it, I know it. One day he's gonna be old too. And you'll see most of my portraits have someone else or something else in the photograph as a reference point. There's usually a relationship that goes on. It's not just the image of a thing or a person, it's about a relationship or a concept. My friend, where we spend uh, some time in the summer when we go north, uh, Sydney, he lives in Philly. I'm in his kitchen, he loves music. And I see he has a picture up, a print up of Picasso's musicians. And I say, Sydney, can I take your portrait? Just move slightly closer 
and I take his photo, which he loves. And because he loves music, loves this, the relationship. And of course, if you notice there, there the beady eyes. My cousins, we stayed over one night in New Jersey and we we're having breakfast. We're going down for breakfast in the morning. And it occurs to me when I saw their fridge, it's covered with family photographs. I said, how about I take your portrait in front of these photographs? Um, because it speaks about your life. And uh, uh, Toby said, but Barry, you know, you took a photo of us 15 years ago and I'd forgotten about it. We have it hanging upstairs. So I said, why don't you bring it down? And they did. And here's their photograph with the older photograph. The clock, of course, to tell us it's a passage of time. And this is their life. But mostly I photograph strangers and I don't ask permission. And occasionally they see me, occasionally they might not like it, but mostly it's welcomed. Uh, Miami, it's Christmas. This incredibly garish barber shop. It's like a Victorian something or other. And I, I, I couldn't resist. I had a point and shoot camera, which is generally what I use, a little point and shoot. And I take this photograph and then she spots me and gives me another. So I leave this encounter smiling. Now, there are a lot of outdoor art shows. I, through the corner of my eye, I see a guy carrying this cute little doll, a uh, dog, um, and he's looking at the pictures behind him. And I think if I just wait here, raise my camera, I'm very close to him, he's going to turn around, which he did. And he turned around and I took the photo. He, he probably assumed I was photographing the whole scene. Uh, I was really interested in him and I cropped out the rest. Now, if somebody dislikes that you're taking the photograph and you, you say, I'll delete it, I'll delete it, it's fine. You might have a moment of shame, but think of the lifetime of happiness. This is someone else's quote that comes from having this experience and having a whole collection of photos. So in an era of divisiveness and strife, which uh, we have now, street photography offers connection, meaning, love, and joy. I'll give you some examples. Um, we're on the beach again. Notice much of our life is on the beach. It's not on the street. It's on the beach is my street. And uh, this group asked my friend Bill, who was sitting next to me, uh, they indicated they wanted him to take their picture, which he's doing. But notice it's sunset, the sun is lighting up their backs. So imagine what their faces would look like. So I decided to intervene. I hopped up and I went over there and indicated that they needed to face the other way. And I had the whole group turn. And then Bill said, you take the photo. And I did. And here we are. And they're happy. I showed them the photograph. They delighted. And then ask, can may I take it with my camera? And they did this pose and I take the photograph. Now they don't speak a word of English because they're from Argentina, they play soccer and uh, they have a blast on the beach, but we are now connected. Now, as you know, I take photos of selfies on sunglasses and the light is perfect. I asked, may I photograph uh, myself, a point to myself and a point to her glasses. And she lets me do a selfie and the sunset is happening uh, behind me. And, but notice we gained from not knowing them at all to five minutes later, right in her personal space, photosing, photographing close up. Um, and then the sun is really sinking and I turn to the sunset and I, I photograph one of the group there, but notice here's the soccer ball. 
So if nothing else, it's a very unusual sunset photograph. And I consider it a street photograph. It shows uh, life on the beach in action, and I'm there to capture it. Now, of course, the next question is uh, about photographing children, because we know everybody's a pedophile, especially if you read the conspiracy uh, literature, let's call it literature. And if they want to insult you, they'll call you an, a pedophile. Not that any of them really probably even know what it means, but uh, it's a sensitive topic. Well, I love photographing children. I love photo. I almost became a pediatrician and I just love little kids. I've got 10 grandchildren of my own and I love telling them stories and we have a blast. So I'm standing in line waiting for tickets to an outdoor garden. Who could resist taking a photograph? Corning Glass uh, Museum, the, it's multi-white light. Out of the corner of my eye, I see an action. I turn around and I snap the photo at this decisive moment that the kid is <laughs> he's looking at me. The drum circle again, and she kept coming back because she enjoyed that seeing that I'm photographing her um, wearing this, this cape. And this is the farmer's market, which I know, Ivan, you weren't that hot on this photo, but it meant a lot to me. There's um, th these hardened photos of, of faces of adult men staring intently away. And there's sort of a V that goes on over here. And the kid is nestled with very tender skin and making Children make wonderful eye contact. So there's a great contrast uh, with this little child. Philadelphia, didn't see an adult around, but look how, how they care for each other, holding hands, walking through. And the, I left this trash in here. I don't do Photoshop, by the way. I, I, a, a little tweaking, but that's it. Um, so um, it just seems like a threatening, you know, city life right there and, um, and going into the big world. So this is at St. Petersburg Farmer's Market. I'm sitting there listening to music. The children are looking to their right. They're looking to their left. I take another photo. And then who would guess? They give each other a kiss. Sweet. Well, it, there we have a resident artist. She puts up installation art. This was one. Don't grow up. It's a trap. Indeed. Imagine the children growing older after many years of marriage. The passion fades a little. So this is Philadelphia Art Museum in the cafeteria. Sort of take an interest in them, take a photo. She looks at him, I take a photo. She looks straight ahead again, maybe sees me. He's still there, does pays no attention. Excitement's over. So am I a voyeur? Of course I am. All street photographers are. This couple are having a quiet moment together. <laughs> I think this is Toronto in an alley of graffiti. Madison Avenue at the Nespresso coffee shop. As I'm walking by, uh, it's, it's clearly a special occasion and it's romantic. Uh, this is near the Lincoln Center. There's an uh, outdoor cafe there, a restaurant. And uh, we know that they're on a date. We know it's true love. Uh, because if you look back behind here, it says true love. So what exactly is street photography? And, you know, if Jay Maisels has this book, uh, it's not about the f-stop. I really love it. And in the introduction, he says, most instructive photography books tend to dwell a great deal on technique and equipment. This one doesn't. One of my best friends, Sam Garcia, and I argue endlessly over our different perceptions of photography. 
recently said to me, photography is not about photography, it's about everything else. I asked, did you make that up? He said, yeah. I said, I think that's the best thing I've ever heard. In this book, I try to talk about everything else. Wow. And, you know, likewise with art, in an art museum, art is not about art. Art is about life, and that sums it up. They're not, they could say the same thing about street photography. It's not about expensive equipments. This is what I use. It isn't about Photoshop. I don't know how to do it. So what is it then about? Now, I think this one photograph will, will just capture what it's about. It, uh, we're, I'm on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's the day of the solar eclipse. People are looking, facing the sun with their special glasses. Some have cameras, some are just looking. I have my back to the eclipse. I'm not looking for this great event. I'm looking to see what, what people do, what's the life like, and what's the everyday sort of experience of seeing people. And this is what I see. <laughs> She's in this pose of almost ecstasy or prayer or reverie. She's checking out her cell phone. These two are talking. This one's taking a selfie. Now, if I try to photograph the solar eclipse, it would be one of millions of photos, most of them better than mine. But this photograph of the difference between these two people is the only one that's in existence. And it gives me, <laughs> it makes me smile. I, I feel happy at capturing the difference between the two. I don't know if they're there together or if they just happen to be there, but I'm capturing this moment. Now, Goldie, my wife, uh, was really insistent. Barry, you dare not claim that, that this is a, a street photograph. It's a photo of your granddaughter and your daughter-in-law. And I was as insistent that it is. I just happened to look up from my couch and there I see Adina sitting on that little table, looking my way. And mother looks at her adoringly and that's my photo. And this is a street photograph. Uh, this is one description that fits my approach. I believe street photography is an umbrella term encompassing things from candid to portraits. It's a spontaneous response to life as it happens in front of your eyes. For me, it's everything I do from taking pictures of my kids to actually physically shooting the streets. The world is a canvas. So we're photographing emotions, we're photographing relationships, life. We use the raw products of light and time. Somebody else wrote something to this effect. It's not my concept. Of course, street photography is indefinable. It's like spirituality. So there are many descriptions of street photography, but there isn't one ultimate definition. As soon as anybody comes up with a definition, Light there are many time. exceptions to that. Light and time, that's what puts it together. And that's, and the, this is what is, is critical in street photography. Well, in every photography, light is critical, surely. But time, that element of time and relationship and emotion and uh, you can't kind of teach it, you grow into it, and, you, and it, you bring your life's experience into the photographs that you take. And as somebody said, you make the invisible visible. So a few things about that street photography is about. It's about awareness, as Cartier Bresson said, a spontaneous impulse coming from an ever attentive eye, which captures the moment and it's eternity. You know, the present is an infinitely small thing because the moment you got it, it moves forward. But it also, once you enter it, it becomes eternity. 
because you can slow time by being in the present as the Buddhists do. So uh, let me show you about my attentiveness, looking at legs. A lot of photographers photograph hands, I do too, um, but legs in this instant. So here he's an artist and he's on the street in Washington, he's selling his paintings. And I'm thinking that all he's doing basically is doing what he did with his pants and putting it on a board. His pants are the, uh, are the art. And, uh, and I think that's the nicest piece of art that he had was his, was his uh, pants. Uh, Metropolitan Museum, who hasn't sat on, the, if you haven't sat on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum, you've missed the best part of the museum. Because downstairs, um, down at the bottom are musicians and hot dog stands and life. And you sit and photograph, I turn my head and oh my goodness, just look at this pairing. You couldn't just independently happen to be there. I love synchronicity. Miami in the fashion district, I'd never seen legs this long. And stiletto heels to boot, <laughs> excuse the pun, to boot. There are shoes here, leather shoes, of course, it's fashionable, it's fashion. But look at the other thing, what she's got in her hand, photograph of herself with her legs. She's presumably using that as a calling card or something. So it's legs, legs, you know, legs, and a lot of legs. Manhattan, Fifth Avenue, and I stood there waiting. And of course, sooner or later, she came along and this billboard with a billboard behind. So it's about time, the decisive moment. And Cartier Bresson said, the photograph itself doesn't interest me. I only want to capture a minute part of reality. So he was, he, he was interested in the action what they did with these photos were not as critically important. Now, this is this is a heck of a, a photograph. This is in Quebec, in Montreal. There's a native uh, uh, artist uh, who painted a number of paintings like this. Uh, and this is Goldie wearing a hat that she just happened to be wearing. And she posed in front of this. And this is a two points that do not touch, but they're almost there, almost like the, the, the point of the, of the present, of the decisive moment. The beach. Notice her lips are not touching him. It is millimeter, a fraction of a millimeter from touching him. This is like that decisive moment where she's about to kiss him. And this is a, a unfortunately a classic narcissistic type, ex, you know, got to photograph this. Goldie in Philly, a balloon comes down. She's a, just about ready to catch it. And I'm fascinated by the people who are looking on and him, him and it's that's the decisive moment. And everyday ordinary moments, this is Provence and these kids are having fun. And there's absolutely nothing special about the photograph, except that it is very special. They were gonna be in a parade, but here they are playing before, uh, before uh, the parade begins and they in their costume. So, Cartier Bresson said, people think far too much about technique, but not enough about seeing, and that the camera is a tool, not a pretty mechanical toy. So later on, they have this parade. And I wonder if, if anybody wants to speak up what you actually see, why is this special? I liked it because it, it was getting dark, it was late, but the camera did, you know, was good here. Um, but there is something special about this photograph besides the fact that it's sort of aesthetically pleasing with the parasols and, uh, and the costumes. But there is something very notable, noticeable about this. I noticed the crosses. 
the crosses, yeah, they were all, this is the costume of that region. They had many different costumes because there were different clans from different regions and they were all uh, in this in all. And by the way, if you've never been to the, the photography, um, the all annual photo uh, photography festival, it's, it's, they've had it for over 50 years and it's totally magnificent. It's mostly photojournalism, but we had a wonderful experience there. We happened to stumble across it and they had the bullfighting and they had uh, parades of people in costume and music. Well, Barry, um, a, cu a couple people said that um, some of the ladies look angry. Only one girl looks happy. No one's smiling. Someone's angry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like really odd that each what she's looking to the left and they're looking very perturbed. She's looking to the right and she's perturbed. She's kind of got nothing of an expression, but she's looking so serene. And I wondered, is she serene because she's leading the way and she's sort of, you know, spearheading this? She's, it's because she's in front or did they put her in front of the parade because of her personality and her serenity. And she, it, it's just a, an incredible experience watching her sort of move forward, but others forming a backdrop that was so different. Um, but on the other hand, rather than just, it's about seeing uh, Don McCullen, who's famous for his war photographs like this one, a guy with PTSD just staring from under those that helmet, said, Photograph, photography isn't about seeing, it's about feeling. If I don't have some kind of feeling for what I'm shooting, how can I expect the person who looks at it to feel anything? And I took this photograph of my son, daughter-in-law, and two grandkids. Seeing them sitting on a bench, they were kind of like taking a semi-nap because it'd been a hard day with the kids and walking the streets of Philly. And I noticed their hands and her thumbs up and that little mischievous smile. And to me, it was a feeling experience, which I think comes through in the photograph. Um, not long after this, my daughter-in-law got breast cancer and has uh, survived it, thankfully, but it, it was terrifying. Street photography is essentially a transfer of feelings and you can't fake it. It's not as easy as it might appear and it's only about being physically close. It's not only about being close, but emotionally close to your work. So your emotions connect with what you see. I love kids and I found myself tending towards children that are sort of separated from and alone. And it sort of relates to my childhood in some way. Uh, he's not, no, you know, he's, he's doing his thing and I'm connecting with the eyes of their child. Uh, this is Siesta Key Beach again. Um, it made a better black and white than color and they've emerged from the water and there's something haunting about this. Uh, most people I show it to don't feel it, but I do. The gap between the two, the stern expressions and the child whose eyes are sunken and looking straight at me. I'm wondering what's the dynamic in the family. And it's reminiscent of some photograph with storm clouds and a warrior emerging, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure where, I, where the original photograph is that's that sort of governs my projection onto them. So there's a tension in photography. It's a technical mechanical reproduction of reality on one hand, but, but on the other, it's an aesthetic artistic expression of emotion and spirit. And I obviously veered to the latter and I'm not that hot technically. So Gary Winogrand said the photograph should be more interesting or more beautiful than what we photographed. 
Yeah, I don't know if I would normally have noticed this, but I, I see beauty here uh, and, and I'm not sure what's foreground. Is it the background that's foreground or is it the foreground that's foreground? I, I totally see the red as leaping out at me, but it makes a nice, nice composition. Just beauty, nature entwined, inter integrated with uh, the individual walking down there. Now, this is the, in the Pope's visit. They were busy setting up. And I happened to come across the scene as they were setting up. And uh, it kind of took me, uh, it sort of grabbed hold of me. And my eye, and I left purposefully left, you know, consciously decided what to leave in. I see this leading into the picture to her, to her with a cell phone over here, to this face, to this uh, woman. And then it sort of goes down to another face down there. Or if one can look at it just going down this way and then taking it over that in that direction, but it's certainly face, 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 face. There's a lot of beauty with the curves of their uh, shawls and scarves. Um, and, and one wonders, what, what is she thinking? What, what's going on? And photography, the photograph asks the question, but we don't provide the answer. Um, and somebody, Ted Grant said, when you photograph people in color, you photograph their clothes. When you photograph people in black and white, you photograph their soul. So I don't do much black and white, but when I do, I love to photograph the colors that are black and white. So, you know, you get these black paintings that looks like nothing's there, but there's something in there. Well, here's somebody with long hair and black facing it, and she as the appropriate background, which is the white of the wall, and she's wearing black. So I'm seeing the contradiction, uh, the, the contrast. I'm just photographing color here. It's, it's nothing profound. And he happened to stop in front. I took the photo. Goldie, the chameleon again with the, uh, the backdrop, she happened to be wearing this. Now, I'm sure some of you know this guy. His name's Luis Mendez, and he's always outside B&H photo photography in New York City with this old camera. And he's a well-known character in New York. He's considered the New York photo street photographer. And he takes photos for 20 bucks, uh, but I'd never seen him before. And uh, he asked me if I want a photo. I said, no, but can I photograph you? He said, okay, you can photograph me. It's going to be $1. I said, sure. And he said, one photograph. <laughs> so this is the one photograph he let me take of him. And black and white is appropriate for this photograph. Montreal, a rainy day, dreary Sunday morning, nothing much happening. He was coming down the street sidewalk and he started to cross over. I was walking from this direction. And at this moment we met and as uh, he looked to, to his left, I took the photograph with him dead center and I just knew it in my body. I had taken it at the absolute decisive moment and it just felt right. And notice Cartier Brasson has something very similar. I just included this to show you the similarity. New York City, St. Christopher Street, of obviously a black and white photograph here. Um, and his, him being there was important. They goofing around, I got in fairly close. Uh, I love that there's this towering background, almost like a hill, a medieval, medieval hill. Um, a lot of action, life, classic New York's. And I was thinking of Robert Frank when he had three guys hanging around when I took this photograph. This is Doylestown, a memorial service for the gays that, uh, that were slaughtered in that nightclub. And I saw her in this moment of anguish 
with her looking so traumatized and him looking concerned. And it's the decisive moment, that moment, where one doesn't even see much of her face, but you can experience the depth of her, of her feelings. In black and white, you suggest, in color, you state. That's true. So I take color as well, and I relish color, because color alone, I think, can, can affect your mood and make you happier. Uh, so much red, farmer's market, and blue and red go well together. This is a Mark Rothko, but in London, uh, I forget which museum, um, there's like a carpet on the wall and the floor and kids playing. And I saw a Rothko color there and took the photograph. Miami, uh, Wynwood, if you love murals, uh, you know, nowadays with COVID, you can't get up close, you've got to be a distance. And these two girls uh, sitting over there, um, cute as could be, but what's the subject? It's the mural, I think, uh, and, and they, the background, but um, the two, the juxtaposition, wonderful. And this is at a comic uh, con uh, festival. And I love that she's got red boots, shoes and black pants and black and red pants and black shoes. What a, a, a festival of color in these two. Now in this case, there were 10,000 people in that building milling around. And I strategically chose a backdrop that was clean and I waited for people to walk past and I asked permission because it was appropriate and would make a better photo. And of course, they were all too, only too happy to pose for me. Uh, and it, would be, it was a much better photo than had I tried to sneak photos around a very bustling uh, huge hall. Pink is in. It used to be a, a fashion color for men. Uh, when I was a kid, it was, of course, for girls, but now it's coming back. And she, of course, wearing, uh, wearing blue. So synchronicity is a big deal with Goldie and myself as we travel, because she has this natural talent for just appearing <laughs> with the right colors on. She doesn't choose it because she knows we're going somewhere. She just always happens to be wearing it. This was the summer in DC. This is St. Petersburg. There's a street of murals. We went there and having never been there before. Philadelphia, somebody had uh, sort of desecrated the sculpture and when we were walking by and look what, look at the. <laughs> um, it's almost inconceivable that she would be wearing this color scheme and we'd pass a wall looking like this, but it is. And this is the new museum in uh, Sarasota that I showed you in the high school building. There was, this was up and she happened to be wearing this with two wrist braces, which made for very nice little black hooves. And she posed in front of this. I think you travel with a suitcase so she can change. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, when we go through airport, she always has tons of hats. When we travel like long distance, she'll pile up like five hats on her head and uh, just go through, you know, go through, check in with, with that. But uh, nope, it just happens. <laughs> this is in Kingston this, uh, this past summer. And it's not a black and white photo. You can see her blue shoes, but we were walking past this building. Oh, and uh, this has really happened. It is not posed. It's the Lower East Side. I, I notice, I look down and I see the writing on the sidewalk. Okay, I don't know if you can, <laughs> if you can read it. Fuck your phone. Keep your head up as Goldie is crossing the street. Oh, we had a, an event at home where the fan uh, was damaged. We had a, an electrician come and he walked past my daughter's painting. And I said, can you hold it? I need to take your portrait. 
So she painted this in Seattle and it's a war veteran. And, she, uh, and he happened to be in our condo and there you are. Ellsworth <laughs> Kelly, that's the art museum. So I don't photograph a thing. I photograph a relationship, a connection. I should be finishing up soon, um, which comes with my background of holism. I see the connections, whether they exist or not. She's the Pope's visit. She's on the phone, but I see he's got a phone too. So I assume the two are talking. Bryant Park, New York, farewell. She's tearful. At the moment I'm photographing, He's indicating his boredom. Ferry to Staten Island. If I photographed him alone, it's an Orthodox Jewish man. He's got a tzitzit hanging down. It would be, okay, I'm photographing a man. If I photographed her, it would be a mom with the kids. This is an unnecessary, you know, to have mom there. But the fact that he's been, he's looking at her and he was looking at her the entire trip across makes one wonder what, what's in what's on his mind or maybe you don't even have to wonder uh in our art museum in chicago and i think that's where it is i see a kid run past the gallery to the wall where he's charging his cell phone i've never seen that before uh in a major art museum and he's crouching over looking at his cell phone and i'm thinking he's so detached from this huge scene of Christ and the money changes, he's totally disconnected. But then I look and I think, you know, look at the color of his clothing. Look at the colors. Look at them crouching. Look at him crouching. Look at the diagonal from top there all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, right up to him. And look at this. It's a rail, but it looks like an arrow pointing to him. And of course, he's plugged in to the scene. So he's connected and disconnected. Um, just one of those decisive moments. A few seconds later, he was gone. This is obviously in the metro in New York City. And I think there's a bag or something. And I realize it's a person. And right next to it, her in this full burqa is this girl with her legs leg bare, short skirt, blue and black. I look again and I see blue and black. And the color's the same. The one is interested in fashion. And guess what? This, this one too, because there's this ring of decoration. And I see through this vast divide, there is a connection, accidental as it might be. Quickly, a uh, portrait of my friend Dick, hands and hands, but I couldn't stop looking at this girl. So when I'm doing a portrait of him, I include her in the scene and it, uh, it's, it, um, and I keep her in, uh, even though there's the strong connection between hand and hand, I'm indicating in this portrait, it's almost a self portrait of the photographer. It says what the photographer is taking notice of uh, as much as a portrait of Dick. So the difference between photojournalism and street photography is the intentionality. A photojournalist goes out on assignment, he's going to photograph something, but then at the end of the day, that very same photojournalist might put his equipment down, pick up a little phone or a cell phone and walk the streets for the pure pleasure of experiencing life and take photos. And it could be of the same subject and the photos could be identical, but the intention is different. So I just happened to come across the scene. The unifying thing is the color red, color red, color sort of pulls it together. And of course he can double his freedom. Yeah, yeah sure he can double his freedom. Uh, but there's also a question, is he homeless? Because he's very well dressed. A scene in New York, don't have to go into it too much, but that's the Lindy Hop Festival, a Swedish band, people photographing, people taking selfies, people looking at the dancing. 
generally happy. It's a happy occasion. But look at like that nun. I, I wonder, what is she thinking? And she's wearing red, which draws attention to her. What is she thinking? Is she be, why, what's that expression mean? So the aim of life, as Henry Miller said, is to live and live means to be aware, joyously, drunkenly, serenely, divinely aware, which is what you are when you're out photographing. But now we have a problem because it's a wonderful time to be a photographer. It costs me nothing to take photos. Um, but it's never been a worse time to be a street photographer, you know, uh, like this, you know, here I can photograph this, I come right up, I take the photo of him, Goldie's there, creates balance, it's an interesting shot, and he thinks I'm photographing her, but I'm really interested in him, and the two of them are a good juxtaposition. Uh, that's what, I would do that in normal life. Normally this summer I might be in France as I was before, where they won the, uh, the uh, soccer World Cup and there was a riot, but it was a happy riot. And notice happy, happy. It was a happy riot, but it was wild, really wild. Lots of alcohol, lots of noise, screeching cars, a lot of color, movement, energy, excitement, interaction, danger, life. There was just so much going on. But now, we have to be cautious, we separate. We can't be spontaneous. I have to plan absolutely everything I do and be and focus on safety. This is where the Amish live. And the streets was empty, they were gone because of COVID and they fill up this, this part of Sarasota during the season, but there was a solitary biker. Washington DC this summer, They opened the gallery, the, the, some of the museums, and this was the National Portrait Gallery, and that's Goldie. But the empty, emptiness, the lack of stuff of going on, and you blame it on COVID-19. So now I photograph things like this. This was in the summer on the steps at the um, Jenkintown train station. I miss you, 12.30 a.m. It's a street photograph. It has a, it has a message, a narrative, an aesthetic, a selfie. My Orthodox Jewish family, they all had COVID except the little girl with red hair. And sitting in a car in, in Sarasota and he walks by with, for some reason, his face is all colored and the photo is really of her and her reaction to him, but I'm safe, I'm in a car. So just to finish up, uh, street photography is also about having fun, seeing the guy ride a bicycle like this with a backdrop. She's talking, but there's a person eavesdropping or looking at her behind. Montreal, green, semi-naked girls, women, with green luggage <laughs> going in the subway. Love the reaction of mother and, and child. It's so much fun. You, you couldn't do this in America today, but this was Montreal a couple of years ago. But finally, street photography is also about love. Siesta Key Beach, he had just proposed to her <laughs> and he had music in this little piece of sand sculpture. He had a professional sculptor, something, and he had music playing from the sand sculpture. But it took them the longest time to get there. So this, the, the water starting to erode, and I thought all was lost. But finally they showed up, paused, he proposed to her, and look at the expression of the onlookers. They're so excited. And she was too, and she accepted. Paris. It's all about love. And in Toronto, they had these balloons, these huge love balloons, and the two girls were sitting there and asked, are you watching it to make sure nobody damages the display? And they said, yes. So I said, do you mind coming to pose for me? And they did. That's their pose. I didn't ask them to pose like that. So they got caught up in the action. And while I'm doing that, 
a woman walks right past in front of me, unaware that I'm taking the photo, but notice that she's wearing the perfect colors to blend right in and add to the picture. Then I met the artist who was in a pop-up store and she, posed, and she posed there. And I had a conversation with her about her project of taking love around the country and, and what she was accomplishing with these big love balls and trying to transform the experience of people. And we spoke for about 15, 20 minutes and then I, saw, I got ready to leave. And I said, can I take your portrait? And she said, sure. And then she said, you know, this is the best conversation I've ever had in my whole life. Wow. So that can happen when you photo, when you can get relationships with strangers and when you're on your own, because you're vulnerable, just like they are. When we travel as a couple, there's less of this intimacy. So street photography is mostly about luck. And I'm walking and we're walking in the gallery part of, of Paris two years ago. I see a, um, a Steve McCurry exhibit being put up in a gallery. It's not ready. I walk in and I say, uh, I know you're not ready for, for visitors, but I love Steve. I love these photographs. And the, the gallery owner says, you want to talk to Steve? And I said, no, you don't understand. I love the, the photograph. And he calls Steve out and he lets me take his photograph. And I was quite nervous about it. There's Goldie to show it's, it's my photos. So that's kind of the highlight of my career is I met uh, Steve McCurry and took his portrait. So thanks for staying awake. I hope you're awake. And 